I'm Bud Dale, and this is my partner, John Gould, and we're here to talk about attorney-expert relationship. We're proposing a, a new idea to add to the tools that you have in thinking about attorney-expert relationships. I conceptualize part of what we're going to talk about today as um, trying to look at how aspects of our field can move forward. For those of you who are familiar with my writings over the years, my writings with David Martindale, who's here, um, <clears throat> I think that 15 years ago, 10 years ago, the concept of the forensic model, the concept of being more scientifically informed, created a firestorm uh, in many areas of the custody world. And today, I think it's just considered uh, a floor of where we begin when we start thinking about how to do work. I see as the next stage or the next step in thinking about role issues, thinking about uh, whether, how that term applies, and Bud is working hard to articulate a new paradigm. I went to law school from 2009 to, or 2006 to 2009, and my evidence and civil procedure professor had this saying, and it was, don't think great thoughts, read the rules. The second piece, but I believe you can get to the same place we get on the expert, attorney expert relationships by reading the psychology ethic rules. And the most important thing is that every activity should be evaluated with respect to the degree that that activity impacts the expert's objectivity, competence, or effectiveness, or risk exploitation or harm to the client with whom you had the initial professional relationship. That's 3.05 in the APA ethical code. Obviously, attorneys litigating child custody cases can turn to mental health people for help. There's some research that as many as 55% of attorneys report using some kind of mental health expert in some way. They can help, help you present your case. Uh, and what we're going to examine here are the issues related to attorney-client privilege as applied to experts, what would be a called derivative privilege, work product doctrine and discovery dilemmas that are related to expert relationships, and then the choices of how attorneys can use the mental health expertise that they access. We see four different kinds of services. One of the services you can provide as an expert is consultation to the attorney about the evaluations. You might call that being a reviewer. There are various forms of litigation support that you can provide to the attorney, and that's been called being a consultant. There are educational kinds of things that you can, and emotional supports that you can do for parents. It's been a, called both appropriately and pejoratively coaching. Uh, other instances might involve therapy. And then testimony at trial. Obviously, there's a potential for you to be a testimonial witness. And then the last thing that I'm going to note here is my belief that you can combine these activities or these services so long as you meet those two requirements on which were on page one. Read the rules, and so long as you can maintain your objectivity, competence, and effectiveness and not exploit and harm your clients. In our paper, we talk about three different kinds of science, and science is a big thing. It's a real buzz term here, but obviously there's lots of scientific knowledge and research on just about any topic or variable that you could identify. And those could be anything relevant from the factors in the statute to facts driven uh, that are driving questions in your individual case. Uh, there are moves or calls to integrate science, scientific knowledge into your reports by different references or citations when you can. I think that helps your credibility. I think it shows that you've prepared yourself and that you're competent. Um, that's the good side of things. The bad side of things, as we all know, is that not all the research says the same stuff, that you can usually find, just as people claim they can find experts for whatever they want to say, they can find research for some things that they want to say. The statistics that are used in the research now are becoming more and more complicated. And some of the research studies that I try to read, I call them two-nap chapters. 
Okay, I have to take two naps to just plow through it. Uh, I almost have to. I used to when I was a graduate student and I read Freud. I used to read the last four or five pages of Freud because I wanted to know where he was going. And I find that I have to do that with a lot of the research studies now. I have to re read the results and discussion section and then come back and figure out what's going on. I think there's a real value to that. And when I can't do it myself, I need to get help. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the things I've learned from my mentor, Linda Elrod at the Washburn School of Law, is that you have three choices when you're faced with a dilemma, and that is get smart. Sometimes that's kind of hard. Get help or get out. Okay. The second kind of science, and this has been the real emphasis, I think, of uh, the work by David Martindale, John Gould, the forensic model, and what they brought to the table about the emphasis on methodology. And for us to really take a good hard look at methodology and um, a, a related concept I would call procedural fairness. That's kind of the um, what they teach judges about about things. And procedural fairness is a compilation of respect, of allowing the person voice, of being neutral, and being fair. And I think we have to use that in our scientific approach and in our child custody evaluations, as well as in the work we do providing these other services. And then the third kind of Science has to do with scientific theories or systems of logic. And I think you have to look at this at both micro and ma macro levels. At a macro or a, a macro level system kind of level, we don't have any research that says that the behavioral scientific approach is better than the psychodynamic or the cognitive or the cognitive behavioral or those orientations or even that psychologists do this better than social workers or psychiatrists or even attorneys who are GALs. We don't have any research who, that says who does this best or what theory works best. I think we have to, as we outline not only the data that we collect, but we have to, under, to outline some of our system of logic. When we apply these theories on the micro level in an individual case, I hear more and more, and I know some of the colleagues, I know Phil Stahl and Robert Simon have written an article for the quarterly on the importance of analysis in child custody evaluations so that you can examine, someone else can examine, the court can examine, and know not only the facts and the data upon which you formed your opinion, but how you put them together in either a theory or a story of the case that makes sense. And then there are additional obligations that go with that in being scientific with our hypothesis testing and looking at alternative hypotheses or, and perhaps as we get further along in, in this, from my mind, it gets a little more controversial, but many have proposed that we have this obligation not only to say what we believe, but to show that we've we believe that because we've considered other things and rejected them, that we've collected other data and rejected it. The literature focuses on the proposed solution for this was supposed to be, to avoid the battle of the experts, was to, supposed to be a court-appointed expert. And it's fairly obvious to us now that n none of us are completely devoid of, of bias whether we're aware of it or not, and that having court-appointed experts was not the solution that we would have wished it to be. I do think in many instances it does help us focus on the best interest of the child. I think we, we can have a debate a little bit about the one of the boundaries about the best interest concept, and one of those boundaries is about psychological best interests and what best interest means legally and whether evaluators should be commenting on things that some people think are solely legal and how we deal with some of those boundaries. Those are open debates, um, not in every courtroom, but certainly they're open debates when we come to a place like this and hear some of the most sophisticated think thinkers in the country talk about uh, their work. But let me jump in here. Bill? 
Um, how many, by show of hands, how many people here were at AFCC in Chicago? Anybody happen to attend my session with Joy Feinberg? All right, you can go to sleep for a second. <laughs> Joy said something, and, and this has been at the forefront of a lot of my lectures now to uh, mental health professionals, because it really was humbling. Uh, and it kind of elaborates on a little bit on what Bud was saying. Joy did kind of took a couple of slides to talk about the history of how child custody evaluators came into being as a cottage industry and the hopes that the legal system had for the ways in which evaluators could assist the judges in providing good quality, reliable, trustworthy information that could assist them in their decision making. And Joy, as well as other uh, legal colleagues who I've uh, presented with, have made the point that there is a, a vocal minority that is growing among many attorneys that have found that we have failed miserably. And there are many uh, attorneys who I've worked with in this vocal minority who are actively seeking ways to get custody evaluators out of the system because the quality of our work product is so poor. So I, need, I think we need to be mindful of the fact that <clears throat> we need to do better. I did not attend Tim and Jeff and David's presentation, but I understand that they were talking in that about a lot of limitations that they have seen in evaluations over the years. This is a place to think through and to talk with people about how to increase the quality of evaluations and I think that that would serve us as mental health professionals well by helping to preserve what is called this cottage industry, but more importantly, help better serve families and the judges that are expecting good quality work from us. Part of it has to do with the lack of understanding of science's process. <clears throat> really understanding how do we get from A to B without making enormous jumps in logic, having all of our opinions grounded, if we can, in either really well-developed clinical judgment that's literature-based or empirical work that's, in, that's literature based. So I didn't want to leave number one, excuse me, number one before expressing that opinion. I'm going to move through the slides fairly quickly here too. Obviously, it, we all struggle with the fact that courts still can grant considerable defer, deference to the experts they appoint. They like who they appoint. That's generally why they've appointed them. Because on the one hand, there's an increasing sophistication to our methodology that we're able to focus on the things that we think get us more accurate results, more reliable results. But on the other hand, we still know that evaluators can be biased. They can forget to do things. They can overlook issues. And if you went to Jeff and Tim and David's presentation, they can often do some really bizarre stuff, okay, that we would think and look at from a distance um, as pretty, pretty remarkably uh, off task. And I'm going to jump in here again with the notion of bias. I think that the literature on bias is continuing to expand, and I think that we think we're learning to think in terms of broad concepts such as retention bias, confirmatory bias. But I want to suggest that there's another type of bias that I don't often see represented in the literature. But as I do peer review work, and I'm sure my colleagues do peer review work, you see bias also in this way. <clears throat> you see bias in the ways in which evaluators don't articulate the particular belief about parenting theories that guides their decision making and how they collect data and how they think about the role of the mother and the father in the family system. And things like that where our own pet beliefs wind up driving how we collect data. In Steve Herman's talk yesterday on child sexual abuse, he mentioned that there are the, the range of individuals who believe that child sexual abuse occurs more than 75% of the time is pretty high among CPS workers. For me, it seems that one of the questions that you want to ask a person in that role is, what is your fundamental belief about how often this, this event occurs? Because that is a statement, in my view, of bias, that they have already decided 
that it's more likely than not that it's occurred because they believe it occurs 75% of the time. And then you begin to look at ways in which they have looked at their data, the way in which they may have skewed their data because of their fundamental belief systems. So we need to be looking at some of these underlying issues about how we think about mother's roles, father's roles, theories of parenting. And I don't think that that's often discussed in our bias literature. I often get uh, accused of going back and forth between legal and psychological paradigms because I'm both a psychologist and an attorney. Um, so if I get accused here, I'm not going to be surprised at that. I think we have to justify uh, science and its inclusion in the courtroom. Uh, my tagline of my email is a quote from Stephen Breyer that basically says, the, science, the courtroom is not a scientific experiment, but we have to do things in court that are consistent with science. We talk in the paper about the culture that we have, and part of the, our culture has the expectation that we would be doing some kind of scientific or social science studies to understand our work and our process. I've gone back and looked because we don't have a lot that justifies our work. We don't have a lot of research that says, if you know science, attorney, if you know science, you do a better job. There is a study, though, in 1987. How many people have read this study in 1987 called There's a Book Out? Anybody ever heard of it? The book out was Beyond the Best Interest of the Child by Goldstein, Solnit, and Freud. Okay? And what they did, what Peggy Davis did, this is in 1987, Harvard Law Review. And what they did was they looked at the study or the cases that involved psychological parent theory. And what they found was when the attorneys knew psychological parent theory, they were more likely to have a favorable outcome, whether you were supportive of it or whether you were contesting it. If you didn't know how to contest it, as an attorney, your client was at a significant disadvantage. If you don't know how to contest science, if you don't know how to contest an evaluator, your client's at a significant disadvantage. So, but that's the only, if, if others know of other thing, I know um, Ramsey and Kelly have called for more data about the effectiveness of child custody evaluations. I think our best defense as a field right now is to say that the court keeps using us. That means they must be getting something. I don't know how convincing that is. We also know how little market forces actually change behavior of, of various people because of all the complex dynamics that are involved in relationships in courts. We do, need to, we do know that as a result of places like this and some of the people who've developed these ideas, child custody evaluations have become increasingly complex. In fact, it is called the best interest of the child vague and indeterminate, and we'll go. It's complex. It's incredibly complex. It's a set of questions that generates another set of questions that generate a set of hypotheses that demand us to look in certain places. There are services that can be used, or that are usually limited in scope and in interpretation, okay? There can be an evaluation of something the court appointed evaluator, poorly evaluated, missed or refused to consider. We might decide that the expert is going to be used for what is, has been called instructional, blind didactic, social framework or educational testimony. Um, I flew out here from uh, Kansas and I was on and, and in the in between flights with a judge from Kansas and I always love to have this opportunity to learn from judges and uh, his idea was he'd been on the domestic bench for a while he, and he didn't think much of the idea of educational or social framework testimony <laughs> okay he thought he knew enough and perhaps he does uh, we also all run into judges and courts that are fairly new because the plum dockets for judges are the domestic dockets. That's the one when they get named a judge, they always choose and they come down. No, that's not how. They get assigned. <laughs> okay. It's the, it's the hardest docket. It, ha it requires the most of them. So trying to educate a judge in a delicate uh, 
child custody situation is something we often try to do. There are reviews of reports by other people, maybe reports for a review of mental health records um, that have to do with treatment or various evaluations. Uh, here I note that and there was a study by James Bow, who seems to try to figure out what everybody is doing, but he notes the frequent use of mental health experts in trying to get help for their clients. In writing the paper, I took a real good look at the AFCC task force on child custody consultants. And uh, the paper did not, although I think the group, and I was not a part of it, but I think the group tried to come up with guidelines. It ended up, uh, they ended up writing a paper and noting that there weren't, there weren't agreements on a number of the ways to figure out what you should do or could do in various different kinds of, of capacities. Um, they did come up with a, a list of 17 areas. This is in the paper, and it's also in the AFCC paper, obviously, that an attorney can use an expert to help their client. Uh, and those range from uh, helping them deal with the anxiety of the, the, the process, helping them understand what the process is going to include, what evaluations are going to include, uh, as well as the preparation of uh, these people for witness testimony. There are obviously problems when we're, as an expert, coaching people to give inappropriate or inaccurate answers or whether we're doing something where we think they're going to make some temporary change and try to disguise true motives or present themselves in a disingenuous fashion to the court. I do know that uh, I'm here with, with John, who's part of one of the authors of the forensic model, and I know Dr. David Martindale is here as well. I think people quickly picked up on the forensic model when we're using experts and its utility uh, for organizing your thinking, organizing your presentation, and particularly organizing examination and cross-examination. The forensic model, as you know, is a combination of ethical principles, guidelines, and ideas from evidentiary law. And when we start combining ethical principles, guidelines, and law, uh, I think we have to be careful we're just exactly, when we use that model, just exactly what we're referencing. For example, if we're re referencing an ethical principle as a foundation for examination or cross-examination, I think that should be treated as having more credibility than if we're referencing an aspirational guideline. If we're referencing a law as support for some kind of foundation for examination or cross-examination, I think that should be weighted in accordance with, uh, we should give the credibility for that foundation um, more weight as well. One of the ways that Bud has challenged my thinking on this issue has been the notion of what defines a floor and what defines a ceiling. And I certainly have for years been an advocate for um, both the forensic model that, and, and, and in fairness, this was David's concept uh, to develop this. <clears throat> um, but to use that as a starting point for how to look at the quality of child custody evaluations. And then as I talk to judges around the country, what I would often get back from the judges is you're talking about the Cadillac model. How do you develop a model that can serve people who have less money who communities that don't have forensically trained specialists. And that, combined with Bud's notion, started getting me to think that, at least in my thinking, that I had been advocating a model that was uh, making a statement about a level of excellence that few people in the country have risen to. And that a lot of judges, when they hear me at least, talk about this are critical of the fact that we're not giving, that I'm not giving more leeway to those people who are still producing competent work products but are not doing everything that the model that we, that we wrote about says to do. So he, Bud's kind of gotten me to start thinking about what defines the floor and to reconceptualize some of the ways that I've been thinking in the past as truly aspirational models but kind of 
being a little bit more flexible and giving our colleagues some leeway in recognizing that not everybody can do the Cadillac of services, deliver the Cadillac of services, and not everybody does an A-plus report every time they hand a report in. That's been a tough issue for me. But I think it's part of the way that we as evaluators need to think about how do we look at those individuals who are doing competent jobs in the eyes of the court, but yet not doing what we believe, those of us who adhere to the forensic model, um, is not quite up to the level that we want to see the profession of practicing. I'm not sure how to handle that, but I know that I'm, I'm struggling with that issue right now. How many people have read D. Kirkpatrick's article in the Journal of Child Custody about um, the ceiling and the floor? Ceiling floors? on the floor, yeah. Okay. And what D. does is go through, and, and what I think a number of, of uh, people here have done, is to say we, we need to be doing the best that we can every single time. I don't think anybody was going to disagree with that. All right? What I struggle with is cases that don't have the money to do the ceiling. Right. And the best way that I understand this is that making what I call, okay, and I think I, John told me, told me that he gets off the phone with me and it takes him a while to figure out what I've said. And then in the next conversation we start there. I think it's a very effective cross-examination technique to make the ceiling look like the floor. Okay? By that I mean... Saul? Okay. By that I mean looking through the guidelines, looking at the standards, looking at the research, looking at what's generally accepted, and seeing whether or not this person did that. Okay? And I think that reflects on that evaluator's credibility. David. David, I don't think, certainly I don't disagree with that point. The, the, the issue that I was trying to get at, I think, and I'll take more responsibility on, on, on this, is that when I've talked about this historically, I don't think I've sold it well. I think I've sold it in terms of more of a Cadillac, and the feedback I've gotten from judges is that the people in our jurisdiction can't afford to do that. The point that you've just made is a point that I don't often make, and I think I need to integrate that into the discussions, that, that the AFCC model standards are a good template, if you will, that will increase the trustworthiness of the data, but it doesn't necessarily speak to having to have more expensive evaluations. That's not a piece of the presentations that I've been doing over the years, and I think it's an important piece to add. So, uh, so again, it was the it was the first issue of the Journal of Child Custody. It was Leslie. Did I see her walk in? 2004. D. Kirkpatrick, a floor, not a ceiling. I agree with you. <laughs> uh, and the point, that's the point I was trying to make, is that the judges look at, some judges, will look at the quality of the work product that we would see as inferior or we would see as less trustworthy. So we have to get out there and sell it. But if we sell it in terms of just the Cadillac model, we're going to lose a lot of people. There needs to be another way to talk about this. And David may, very well may have just nailed how to talk about it which is that these, these model standards, more so than the a, APA guidelines, um, are a good template to use, but you still need to be concerned about the reliability of the data, the reliability of the procedures. Tim? Have you ever tried to turn the question around on these judges who asked this question about the, the Cadillac model and say, Judge, you have a family that cannot afford a Cadillac, exactly how do we do them a favor by giving them a car well, I, I agree with that. And I think that, that the, the answer is no. I've never, in a workshop, turned the question back to a, a judge who's asked that question. Uh, nor would I. <laughs> Uh, but I think it's a good question to ask. And I think the few times that I have engaged in conversations along that line, I never get a satisfactory answer. 
Uh, I'm trying to think of who. Where's Susan? Susan, you and I had a talk about this in uh, in Washington about how do you develop a model. I don't think anybody's looking at how to develop an alternative model, and I'm not sure that there is uh, an alternative model to what we have articulated. I want to make a comment. To oh, there's Susan. <laughs> I don't think anyone is going to debate uh, how little sometimes the court gives people who come before it. As a psychologist, I complained for years in my jurisdiction until I've, I, I kind of have to run into the comment about uh, that Otto Bismarck makes about I've now been to the sausage factory, okay? And now know what goes into the sausage. <laughs> I've gone and watched dockets where 10 cases are rushed through in 30 minutes. I've gone and watched where people with little information are afford and, and, and actually in L.A., Pam Ludolf and I and Bob Emery and Peg Brenning talked about this, was individualize, approximate, or template because a lot of what people are getting, whether you consider it a, a car without brakes, they're getting the template. They're get, they're procedurally, this is, we call it the Shawnee County Family Law Guidelines, and we have different plans for different ages of children, but it's, you get the guidelines, see you later, bye. As I think about the, the best way to try to get people to streamline the, what we refer to as the Cadillac, or what it has been, I don't refer to it, but other has, and that is the notion of specific questions. If you can generate in your jurisdiction a bench that understands the value of saying, not this buckshot comprehensive evaluation stuff, give me specific questions. That helps to focus the resources and the energies and the monies that are going to be spent. So that would be, I think, the most important first step. And many of us have been writing about that for, for absolute years. And the seminal article that most forensic psychologist site is by Dan Schumann and Stuart Greenberg, and it identifies, it's, it's about irreconcilable conflict between those two roles. It talks in that article, too, and I, I, it's always good to go back and reread it, because it talks in the article about the seductiveness of using a therapist as a, an evaluator, in part that they would say that why would the person have come in and lied to their therapist? I don't know how many people do therapists and have patients who never lie, okay? Uh, but it also says that they don't have the stresses of court when they're reporting things to their therapist. Anyway, I would encourage you to go back and read that article. Uh, it, it is like 1997 in the uh, Professional Psychology Research and Practice Journal. <laughs> the story back there, Bill Austin saying I'm right on that quote. <laughs> Uh, but we're in agreement, I think, mostly at AFCC, a therapist should not be evaluators, and we should keep those two things distinct. Now, those four roles that we're thinking about using experts for, we have a trial consultant, we have an educator, we have a reviewer, and we have a testifying expert. I like to think in terms of activities and services when I think about these because especially if you're trying to apply the dual role prohibition, I don't know how to get to being an expert, a testifying expert, or to have my expert get to being a testifying expert without having them do more than one activity. Because I'm not going to put an expert on the stand whose testimony is not known to me, I need to have my expert do whatever they're going to do and then talk with me. And the general practice is they verbally give you a report and you decide if you don't like their report. If you don't like their report, you decide they're done. If you like their report, you ask them to do something else. You may ask them to provide a written report I believe that you can ask them to collect other data. Not everybody in this room believes that, okay? And when you have them testify, 
they have already consulted, they may educate the court, and they have already reviewed some kind of data. They've performed four activities. And if we call those roles, they performed four roles. How does that make sense? So I'm proposing that we not talk about roles. <clears throat> I'm proposing that each of the activities that we look at be evaluated by don't think great thoughts, read the rules. Each expert's activity will be uh, identified and evaluated as to their objectivity, their competence, the effect, their effectiveness, and whether or not that activity risks exploitation or bias from the client with whom they've had the relationship. In the paper, I go through, I've gone through and I'm a psychologist, but I went through, there's a whole bunch of sociology literature on role concepts and what, what they can do. And they, the social psychologists and the sociologists argue all the time about what different kinds of roles are. And the roles are a set of social expectations associated with uh, a certain set of activities. I just don't believe they help me think through these cases. Um, all of the problems that plague application of role theory apply to child custody consultation. The reason the AFCC task force for child custody consultants could not come to a consensus was some people reviewed this way, some people educated this way, some people did lots of different things. And the field was not ready for settling on one set of rules at this time. I don't know that we're ready yet. I hope we're in a dialogue where we can talk about different ideas and that this is one that can be a part of the dialogue. So what rules do you read? Obviously, you need to read the ethical principles. And here I cite to the ethical principles. Um, not, not every multiple relationship is unethical. Okay? For example, the, if you see children in therapy and you talk to their parent, is that a multiple relationship? He's shaking his head no, but is it? It depends. <laughs> I can show you appellate decisions that impose a duty on the therapist with respect to talking with the parent so that they have a relationship with the child and with the parent. If you're only, if, 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 so I believe that that's a multiple relationship. It's just not unethical. Why? Because it's necessary sometimes to be effective. If you're the child's therapist and you are asked to be an evaluator, you're only, maybe the child is two and you wouldn't evaluate the two, you interview the child, are you performing a multiple relationship that's unethical if you try to resolve the dispute between mom and dad? I think the answer is yes. Some multiple relationships are unethical. Some multiple relationships are not. David. David. I think it goes beyond economics. I think economics are a power influence, powerful influence. And uh, David will be on the plenary. I'm going to be there. Mark Lee and Robert Simon will be on the plenary. And I think it's the second plenary in San Antonio in November. Uh, and, and I hope before, between now and then, we'll have plenty of chances to talk. But I think there are additional considerations than that, just economics. I think it's overly simplistic to throw this at the... Uh, the foot of money. One of those is if anybody, this is the manic compulsive piece of me, uh, when I get invested or interested in something, one of the things I do about the law is that I go and check out the law in all 50 states. Okay? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Linda Elrod, my mentor, is the editor of the ABA Family Law Quarterly, and every year, uh, and it ju just came out, she is a law in 50. And it's got charts in the back. And it has charts in the back. And now she's, they're actually putting statute numbers on those charts because I've asked her to, and I've done some of the research myself. 
to, to help put them in there, but so that you, when you look at that, you can actually know where to go look, either the statute or the cases. And I've got so a lot of different lists of best interest of the child and uh, relocation statutes and uh, different things. So I did this with respect to uh, discovery of experts because one of the things that drives this idea of not combining roles is the idea of discovery. And what I found is that the history of discovery of the work of experts has its own unique story. And that is that in 1993, while frustrated with experts and needing to try to contain and rehab expert testimony, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure went to what is now, I'm going to call, and is called in the literature, the discovery approach. And that basically says that any communication between the attorney and the expert becomes discoverable at the point, the point at which the expert is identified as a potentially testifying expert. So that if later on in your case you decide somebody is, your expert is going to testify, somebody can come in and they can ask you any and everything that you've talked about with the attorney. And the idea is to attempt to curtail the influence of the expert, the attorney over the expert so that the expert wasn't just regurgitating to the court the story they got from the attorney. Even though that was the law, there are courts that didn't follow it. And what they would d depend upon in order to not follow it is some courts would value the attorney-client privilege over the rule. So there were exceptions to the discovery approach uh, to experts. There's a second approach, and that was the federal, uh, the federal rules of civil procedure were modified in 2010, and eight states now follow what's called the protection approach. Kansas is one of those, and what, Kansas, what you have to disclose, uh, what the what you have to disclose is, number one, what you pay the expert, number two, the facts and data upon which the expert forms an opinion, and number three, any assumptions that you ask the expert to make in providing their testimony. The purpose of discovery is to encourage settlement. I think there are so many jurisdictional differences about discovery that it pays us to take a look. And this is why I want us to look beyond finances. Okay? In my jurisdiction, in a domestic case, if I've not provided all the discovery to the other side, we're going to end up in court, and my client or me is going to be paying somebody else's attorney fees. In jurisdictions where discovery is not so open or has different requirements, discovery might be less important. And one of the things I think we have to manage in our trial strategy is discovery. Work product protections can be a part of a trial strategy. We can leak information. We can tell people certain kinds of things. In fact, I thought this idea we develop a theory of the case and get it to the court was a good one. And I think there are lots of ways in which we overemphasize secrecy and underemphasize discovery. You may have been in a mediation process. It might have been a fairly good one. You may have been in an evaluation process. And it might have been a fairly extensive one. There might not be a whole lot to hide. In Topeka, Kansas, or in Shawnee County, where I practice family law, when we go to court, I want to know what the facts are. I'm not, I'm not guessing, because we have this open idea of discovery. So I think when we, we, we start, that's one of the reasons for the role delineation position. I think it's a value one, a valuable one, and I think that many jurisdictions 
would have rules in place that would emphasize that more than what I practice in. Okay? How many people have an open discovery? How many attorneys do we have here? Okay? How much open discovery do you have? It's in what Alan? Pretty broad. Broad discovery. You can ask questions about anything you want. You can get all the documents you want. Okay. Can you just ask? In my jurisdiction, you just ask. We've gotten rid of the other stuff. You just ask the other attorney. Okay. If you were going to have a problem, you'd file a motion. Okay. Do you, how many motions do you have to file to get discovery? Alan, where are you? Alaska. A Anchorage. You're in Alaska. Okay. I, don't, I seldom file motions. I have to file motions to get discovery. But uh, I wouldn't say every opposing counsel has been. <laughs> you know, candid about everything, but we have the ability to ask, please list every fact you know that, that dictates that, that indicates that this person should be given custody. There, there's another reality that sometimes family lawyers are lazy and they don't do interrogatories and they don't do depositions in the same way that, that uh, other cases are tried. Some of the others who, how many people have uh, more formal requirements for discovery. You have what? Yeah, New York. They have none. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, right. Right. So how would you manage if you get, if there's no pretrial discovery, I, I, I've known this because of, of the list, how would you manage pre preparation for trial? Okay, so but so you would you would have to prepare for a lot of eventualities. I, I prepare for every possible eventuality, and I have no idea which one I need. How much money does that save your client? <laughs> I just wondered if it's an economic question. I just wondered, Leslie. David and I had a case in California where a small county had an official procedure whereby the court appointed evaluators were required to shred all their notes upon the issuance of the report. Oh, my Lord. And we brought a motion, David, to give me a declaration. And the judge thought it was just fine with the notes had been shredded. That was the local policy, and of course, that's what should happen. Oh, my Lord. Okay. But can you see how this tent, or Jeff? Jeff, first, uh, thank you for articulating what my slides are going to be in just a bit. <laughs> I appreciate that. Because Bud and I do come from a different, a, a slightly different conceptual perspective on this. Jay, well, I, I was just about to ask you if you can wait, but go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's okay. Asked and answered. Please go right ahead. <laughs> let, let me let me start with this slide because this is this is where Bud and I came. I think we started at different points of departure. Uh, for those who are, ever took an undergraduate course in psychology, you might remember taking a course in uh, conceptual thinking. And the way I think about this concept of roles as well as the way I'm thinking about ways, ways in which to elaborate models of evaluation is that they follow kind of a lawfulness of concept development. You know, first we had ice cream, then we had vanilla and chocolate, and then we had 36 different flavors. We go from, from undifferentiated to polarized to differentiated. That's my understanding of how concepts develop in general. And, and what I'm struggling with, what I'm trying to think through, is <clears throat> that the concept of roles is a useful heuristic. And, and Jeff, this is where I think you and I are similar on that. It's, it's a nice organizing way, but it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient because, as Bud articulated before, when I get hired to review a work product, 
And the attorneys who have worked with me here probably will recall a first phone call with me saying, I'm sorry to interrupt you in your first sentence, but I really don't want to hear your opinion about the report if what you want to do is use me to review this. Because I want to make my own independent judgment. But then I'm going to talk with the attorney. I'm going to talk with the attorney about what I see as the strengths and weaknesses. And at some point, I might be asked to assist or craft my own direct examination questions, which I think are all in the proper ballpark, or at least work with the attorney in crafting the direct examination questions. So we're, we wind up getting into the notion of consulting. So the notion of activities is far more appealing to me. Go to the, go to the next slide up, the one that was supposed to be my first slide. What, where, yeah. what I think is needed, and, and I have yet to put pen to paper on this concept, is if it's possible to develop a grid, a grid of activities on one, on one axis, and then a list of all the potential biasing factors that can influence our judgment when we engage in those activities, which is, I think, Jeff, what you were trying to get at. How do we create a monitoring system so that we make sure that we don't get sucked in without being aware that we're getting sucked in, and as a result of that, provide biased testimony or step into conflict of interests and things of this nature? How do we find a way to better control how we are influenced in the process? But personally, and this is where Bud and I agree, for me, descriptively, the concept of activities, I think, is easier to understand and easier to explain when I work with attorneys than is the concept of roles because there seems to be so much overlap in the activities in which we engage when we, when we particularly if we're in a testifying role, and we engage in some of what we traditionally have called consulting activities. If we got rid of the dual role prohibition stuff, I'd be less, I'd be less troubled by the role language. One of the things that we address in the paper are the, and, and replace the dual role prohibitions with the read the rules and uh, look at the objectivity, competence, and effectiveness issue. I'd, I'd be more comfortable with that. Uh, one of the things we address in the paper are the complex kinds of contracts that you have. And we do recognize that the role delineation practice is a very powerful model, an organizing model. I would tell, as I fantasize what I'm going to do in the plenary with David, I, I would ask you how many people in this room have read David Martindale's stuff about mental health consultations? Raise your right hand. Okay, and how many people are a better professional raising your left hand because you've read that stuff? All right, and I do applaud that work, David. I really do. <laughs> okay, because it's it's when I started doing this kind of work, that was my source, and I've gone to a workshop with David. It was years ago, and I've been on listservs with him for years too. And he's taught me a lot, okay? So I think, the it, Jeff, your comment that the roles have a heuristic function to you, I think that's important. And I think it also leads to a discussion of the contracts that we have. If you've started out and said, because I have to, because I, Dr. Jeff Whitman, have to testify in this court next week and the week after that, I don't want to be seeing somebody who's switching activities. I don't want to be seeing somebody who's gotten really into a lot of consultation and all of a sudden you're going to put me on the stand. I don't want to be seeing, I don't want to be that, that to be a part of my professional identity. And I think that's a choice that you can make. And I certainly think we have to respect that. Nancy?
<laughs> well, and, and that leads to <laughs> Nancy. Nancy, I agree with you, but that leads to an interesting issue that I've I've had. Actually, I have it right now with a case that Bill and I, Bill Austin and I, are involved in, where I'm going to be the testifying expert. Bill is the behind the scenes expert. And I have made my position clear that I didn't want to have a lot of contact with Bill. And the attorney has talked with us about this because my concern is that certain issues will come out at trial. And the attorney's position, and Bill, correct me if I'm wrong here, the attorney's position is, I'm not worried about it. So the next question is, do I go ahead and do that, knowing that the attorney is comfortable if Bill and I have this discussion about this particular case, and and that's where these things get really thorny. Um, I think you make a great point, Nancy, and I'd like to tell you a little story about my research on this case, or on this paper. Um, first of all, I had to learn all the nuances of work, or attorney-client privilege, and and work product doctrine. And if you read most of the statutes about discovery of experts, they only talk about written documents. Okay? So me thinking, well, I'm going to find it in the list. I couldn't find it. So I, I went over to, I, I don't, I'm not very far from Washburn Law School. I went to, went to law school. And I tracked down two civil pr procedure professors. And neither one of them can answer my question. Okay. Uh, one of them did mention that Hickman versus Taylor, which is the 47 case about uh, work product work doctrine, product. Yeah. basically is the common law way of getting to oral communications and including that in privilege or, or work product doctrine and discovery. So that's one part of that. Um, and then when, of course, I asked them about this difference between discovery and protection approach, my, their answer was, huh? Let me know what you find out. Okay. I think you're right. People don't realize some of these kinds of choices. And certainly we don't want as an expert to be running into this and all of a sudden finding out that, oh, everything we talked about is discoverable. On the one extreme, and I know John told me this, and I go, yeah, right. Uh, John told me, he says, well, Somebody calls him up to consult with him, and he says, no, don't tell me anything because he didn't want to know. And I'm thinking, I want that telephone call. Send me a $3,000 check and don't tell me anything. <laughs> I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay? I don't have that style of practice. When people call me, they're saying, but I think this evaluation stinks. I'm not quite sure, but, you know, then they tell me a little bit about the case. And I think you have to stop them because I need to go on to the next session or do something else. But that's how the cases come. And uh, is that in a discovery jurisdiction fodder for the process? Yes. Leslie. I think that we, I think the mental health professionals have an affirmative obligation to be monitoring the way in which we are influenced as we do our work. And even though ultimately it's the judge who makes a decision about the degree to which we may have been biased, we, as I think this is what Jeff was trying to get at, we have to have a way of monitoring ourselves, a way of looking at the ways in which we are influenced by other factors that influence our work because that's going to be revealed in our testimony. No question. But, that, but if you overweigh that against exploring all of the possible issues and the purpose for which you've been engaged, you've overcorrected. Hold on, David. <laughs> Leslie, one more point. I think that I'm fine with what you're saying when, if you include the question when you do that. I don't want to do that before I've read the report and come up with my own independent assessment of this. Then I want to hear what you have to say, but I have, particularly if I can memorialize my opinion, I can be able to testify to the court that this is what my view was. And, and you and the wall will care. <laughs> David? <laughs> David? Um, I, I think something important in what Jeff said. It's fine to observe whatever slippage may be occurring in our object. 
But in the real world, David, with the work that we do, we are constantly invited to um, step into this work, and we have to have we have to be monitoring ourselves. And one solution, as I presume that you agree with this, is to have colleagues around who you can talk to who can tell you, be careful, this is where you're falling down. To constantly have other people who are your, to use Bud's term, your observing ego, to assist you in identifying when you fall down a pothole. Alan. But John, don't you have some responsibility to your Report that uh, there might be something wrong with this report. Oh, sure. <laughs> money to do it. No, well, of course, but they're not telling me where to look. Ah. They're not telling me where to look or how to look um, or the weight to place on it. Um, I, I want to make a comment on, on the bias issue because I think that that's one of the uh, it's it's and and David is been years ahead of everybody else because I think we're going to be learning more about ourselves and bias. I do, however, want to make a distinction between the possibility of bias in a scientific sense and the impossibility that the law can recognize that in the same way, okay, that it would paralyze our system. So it is going to leave this to us as the mental health, this the mental health head of me, okay, to, to figure out how to regulate that and to understand all the distorting parts of that bias and how to make them more uh, understandable. I, I think that's very true. But it's impossible for the court right now to assume that you're always biased. Leslie? You do get that principles. This has been the kind of discussion that I come to AFC, AFCC to have, and I hope that people uh, have enjoyed it. I know I really appreciate my colleagues and friends for participating. So, John? You no, I agree. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your participation. <laughs>